Well, here we are again. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm not sure how many, how many people, hands up, who were here yesterday afternoon for that lecture. Well, that's a pretty good, pretty good indicator. Thanks. Well, thanks for coming back. And welcome to uh, new comrades in this conversation we're going to have about a, a slightly different subject, but we'll touch on some of the same themes. Can business save the world? I mean, it may sound a strange title, given that you might be asking who has ever claimed that business can save the world. But it is actually out there, I think, big time in the development conversation today, the claim that if we all act like a business, if we work like a business, if civil society becomes like a business, if philanthropy acts like a business, even if government acts in a business-like fashion, we will be much more effective and much more efficient in the pursuit of development and social change. I mean, given current offence, I'm tempted to say, I hope it's correct, since none of our other institutions seem to be doing a very good job in saving the world. But I'm suspicious. I'm always suspicious. I'm sort of intrinsically suspicious. Um, but in my own experience, uh, business is as much a part of the problem as part of the solution. There is a positive story, and we'll explore that, as well as some of the criticisms that I'm going to make. But I've always believed, um, and my analysis of history leads me to believe, that a healthy society is one in which three separate but interrelated spheres of action, government, the market, and what I call civil society, the world of voluntary citizen action, are all important and should all be as equal as possible so that they can hold each other in check. So there is always a creative tension, if you like, between those three sets of institutions. Think of it as a three-legged stool. And when one of those legs either breaks off or is longer and, and uh, stronger or more powerful than the others, the stool falls over. When business is too influential in society, we have problems. When there's too much government in society, we tend to have problems. Maybe we have problems if there's too much civil society, though we've never had that um, possibility in history, so we have to wait and see. But I'm concerned that when those forces move out of sync with each other, then we have some problems on our hands. These spheres of action obviously interact and overlap and there are lots of interesting experiments going on around the edges. But their central logics are very different and I want to make that point right up front. The coercive power of government is very different to the voluntary principles of collective action that animate civil society, which are very different to the profit motive which animates the successful market economy. However much we blur and hybridize these distinctions, I want those central logics to be remembered as I move through my remarks tonight. It doesn't mean that any of them are less important than the others. It doesn't mean that we don't need all of them operating, as I said, in some sense of tandem. They are all necessary to achieve what we understand as growth and development. But they are different from each other and they are suited, I think, for different purposes. So, you can imagine my discomfort, I'll admit to my discomfort, as someone who has worked in this framework for about 35 years now, at the arrival on my doorstep of a new neighbour called this horrible world philanthrocapitalism. It's almost unpronounceable. The only reason I can pronounce it is because I use it so often. I'm amazed at Alison, you actually pronounced it correctly, philanthrocapitalism. It was invented by Matthew Bishop, who is a writer for The Economist magazine, to describe the application of business thinking and market mechanisms to the challenges of social change. That's a simple definition of what this thing is. And anyone who spends any time in the world of international development or domestic social change knows that this trend is very much the fashion of the moment. This is what's creating a wave of excitement across the development community. This is what supposedly presages and promises results that we've never seen before in our work. The central premise of this movement is that we need to make all institutions work like business in order to achieve the greatest social good. So this is a new philosophy of action that embraces the use of the market, not just in economic terms as a wealth producing machine, but as a similarly effective way of addressing social problems and that treats philanthropy and foreign aid, if you like, as a form of venture capital investing. But it's not just about that, because this philosophy is being backed by very large resources from a new breed of business-minded donors. Bill Gates, obviously, Warren Buffett come to mind, 
who many people see as the new superheroes of the international scene. They have the ability, the determination, the energy, the vigor to break through the bureaucratic and slow and stodgy constraints of the conventional international development machinery. They don't care about those uh, old stodgy institutions which we all have to deal with, aid agencies and others, on a day-to-day -day basis. And there are other uh, examples closer to home here in Canada, I think, uh, people like Jim Balsillia, of BlackBerry fame and others. So this is not just an American phenomenon. And when these two things come together, when you have market-oriented philosophies of action being pushed forward quite aggressively by billionaires with great wealth and the political influence that goes with it, it's very clear that we have a powerful, significant new movement afoot. And it's that movement I want to talk about tonight by posing the question of whether philanthropic capitalism is a good thing for development, a bad thing for development, or somewhere in between. And if, as some people would claim, <coughs> this process is irreversible, then what do we do about it? How do we react to it? How do we manage the costs and benefits of merging the worlds of citizen-based and market-oriented action? Clearly, some discomfort is healthy. We need discomfort. We need challenge. We need innovation to be kept on our toes because we all have a tendency to get stuck in our ways and fail to notice new opportunities. And as I'll describe a little later, there is an exciting progressive agenda waiting to be organized around a vision of a global social economy going forward, a pathway to humanizing capitalism, you might call it. The problem is that that debate is being dominated by one particular set of answers called philanthropic capitalism in a way which is being radically oversold, <clears throat> in a way which accentuates the positive benefits of this philosophy, which buries the costs and the disbenefits, and which, if we're not careful, displaces support away from other equally important approaches to poverty reduction and other global problems, and it distorts the democratic decision-making processes we need to guide our efforts in these crucial areas in the future. So that's the core of the case I want to make. <clears throat> now, sometimes this movement, when you hear about it, is presented in positive, can-do, almost evangelical terms. There's a slew of recent books that claim that business really can save the world. Or listen to this quotation from Larry Ellison. He's the founder of the software giant Oracle. You probably know, now number four on the list of the world's richest people. The profit motive, he says, could be the best tool we've ever found for solving all of the world's problems. Sometimes it's presented as a negative judgment about the perceived failings of traditional philanthropy and foreign aid and social activism. David Hunter, who's a, a, an evangelist for this approach, writes, there is virtually no credible evidence that nonprofit organizations actually produce any social value at all. In the past, two other critics assert <clears throat> philanthropy was rarely about impact, but now for the first time, donors are seeking to make a difference for the first time. They are ready to make use of the sophisticated management instruments they have developed in their business lives to achieve greater performance in this newer arena. They give purposefully. They think strategically. They rely on measurements and regular monitoring, implying that anything that came before was substandard in some way, sloppy, lazy, irrelevant, or ineffective. I take this personally, you see. And before I go any further, I should clarify, I'm not talking about business in the, in the colloquial sense of being business-like, of being organized, of being professional, about being proficient about our work. I'm not going to talk about competition as simply striving to do our best in the circumstances. Those are things we would all subscribe to, I think. Instead, I'm referring to the formal use of business logic and market mechanisms, like rates of return on investment, enforced competition between organizations to weed out the weak, close supervision over the organizations you support, and standardized outputs as indicators of success. Quote, an entrepreneurial, results-oriented framework that emphasizes leverage, personal engagement, and impatience, as one commentator has described it. And I think if you come from a business background, these things are entirely logical, 
although actually they're not exactly new. I mean, the booms and busts of technology-driven capitalism have always thrown up vast fortunes for a small number of people at certain points 